Johnson County Mental Health Center is helping change lives in a big way for youth throughout the state. On this episode, hear how the Adolescent Center for Treatment is empowering young people with the tools they need to succeed. Whether you live in or just love Johnson County, Kansas, JOCO On The Go has everything Johnson County. Here's what's happening and what's coming up in the community you call home. Thanks for joining us for JOCO On The Go. I'm your host, Teresa Freed, a Johnson County resident and employee of Johnson County government. Last week, we talked about mental health first aid for youth. In part two of our podcast series on youth, we're focusing on Johnson County Mental Health Center's Adolescent Center for Treatment and the great work that's happening there. We'll also have a special focus on gratitude ahead of the Thanksgiving holiday. Here to talk more about that is Kevin Kupelt with the ACT. Uh, that's right. I'm Kevin Kupelt with Johnson County Mental Health and the Adolescent Center for Treatment. I'm the program director uh, for ACT and also the, uh, the program manager for the Adolescent Outpatient and Addiction Services here at Johnson County Mental Health. All right, well, thanks for being here with us to talk about the center and all the great work that's happening there. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what your role is um, there? So, so what kind of work are you doing? Sure, so at ACT, I'm the program manager and director. So I oversee all the clinical uh, staff at, and uh, supervise another uh, BHS staff member, uh, which is the direct care to the youth of ACT. So um, I'm also the program manager for the adolescent outpatient program. So uh, provide all the clinical supports and supervision for the clinical staff for all of our outpatient kids. So uh, my role uh, primarily is the oversight of uh, the day-to-day -day operations and making sure everything runs smoothly and the, the, the care for the kids is uh, meets the state standards as well as um, our local and uh, mental health center protocols and providing just care for kids who needed additional supports outside of the home environment. All right. And so many people probably don't really know what the center is all about and, and what its purpo purpose is. So if you can talk about that. Sure. So the Adolescent Center for Treatment was started about 35 years ago here in Johnson County. And the role of ACT is to provide residential substance abuse treatment for youth ages 12 to 18. Uh, we serve the entire state of Kansas. Although we do put a priority on Johnson County youth, uh, we also serve kids from across the entire state. So many of our kids come to us with uh, severe substance use disorders, along with mental health conditions such as depression and bipolar and um, a lot of trauma history with our kids as well. Uh, with ACT, uh, because we're the only one in the state of Kansas, we have uh, kids coming from uh, you know, probation, the court services, they're in state custody. We also just get kids that are coming that families have concerns about their child's substance use uh, involvement. So really providing a comprehensive level of care for all kids and also focusing on their mental health conditions as well. And so when you talk about that age range uh, going all the way down to 12, it's kind of hard to believe that, that children that young are encountering this issue. So can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So the average age of first use in the state of Kansas for any substance is 12 years old. So we're talking middle school kids. We're talking sixth grade uh, going into seventh grade. So um, the average age of first use continues to go lower and lower as we see uh, the stigmatism attached to cannabis use going, um, going away. Um, the availability of vape devices and, um, and electronic e-cigarettes. So um, kids are using at an earlier age, and we're seeing that we need to now provide more preventive strategies into the middle schools and also start kind of educating folks at the, uh, at the elementary level too. So um, what once was targeting high school kids with substance use prevention and treatment, well, now we're starting to narrow that scope down to a younger age as well. And so what kinds of substances are children encountering? So the number one drug of choice throughout the state of Kansas would be nicotine. So that'd be number one. But then when you pull nicotine and vaping out of the equation, we're looking at marijuana and alcohol as being number two and three. Um, obviously, marijuana is being legalized across the nation from some medicinal uses as well as some recreational use from state to state. So uh, we are seeing more of a, an availability of some of those higher potency marijuana components with edibles. Um, the concentrates are kind of hitting the market pretty hard from, from dab devices and oils and concentrates and carts. And then alcohol is always kind of a staple that's available in a lot of our community and our home environments too. So, um, but then what we're seeing now is a rise in fentanyl abuse with our adolescents and adult population too. So a lot of this fentanyl is counterfeit pills. So 
uh, that appear to be an, uh, an opioid, kind of like a Percocet or, um, or oxycodone, but they are laced with fentanyl. So we're seeing a, a drastic increase in the Johnson County area with youth abusing fentanyl laced products. So is part of the, the work that's done there at the center, is that a detox as well or? So ACT is not a detox facility. We do have the adult detox uh, unit located in our facility for adults, um, but there is not a detox unit in the state of Kansas for kids. So when we do get a kid that admits to our program and they've been using drugs, um, they spend about that first day or two really trying to withdraw from some of those products. Uh, they're real sleepy, they're agitated, they're not hungry or they're real hungry. Uh, so we work with the youth as they're coming down off of those substances and get them acclimated to being in treatment and really kind of assist them and help them get through the next couple of weeks. And you have a pretty tremendous staff there that can provide that individualized care. So at what angles are you coming um, to, to do that? Sure. So we do have a wide variety of staff. So we have um, a full-time nursing staff member that um, is Monday through Friday that helps with the day-to-day -day, uh, medical needs and uh, medication observations and, um, and administration. I've got direct care staff that work in shifts from um, 8 a.m. to midnight. So, um, you know, and then midnight to 8 a.m. So lots of staff doing lots of different tasks and roles. A lot of it has to go um, in terms of um, life skills training and behavior management. I've got licensed staff that provide group facilitation, and then I've got clinical staff that provide day-to-day -day individual therapy, group therapy, family therapy, and so doing a lot there with the, the emotional behavioral piece along with the substance use piece. And then I've got administrative staff that are here to help out with access to care and getting them into, pro, into our program and providing some of those um, the needed help or needed uh, supports to families that are seeking services. And then I know you're focused both on, on the physical well-being and mental well-being. Um, and one of those components is, is getting exercise and lear learning the basic life skills. So can you talk right. about how that's worked into the yeah. center? Yeah, certainly. We do a really a holistic approach to recovery. So, you know, we have um, community members that volunteer their time to come into our program. Um, twice a week, we have a yoga instructor that shows up, does a lot with the youth on breathing techniques and stretching and just really kind of that mind, body, spirit kind of mentality. We do a lot with, um, you know, educating the kids on proper hygiene and proper food intake and not um, drinking a bunch of Dr. Pepper every single day and, and eating a bunch of junk food. Uh, we have volunteers that come in uh, that assist us with anger management with the kids. We have partnerships with the Johnson County Library, so teaching kids about reading skills. We do a lot with journaling, so just really kind of helping them learn different strategies and different ways of coping with not only the stress of life, um, their individual depression and anxiety, but then also how do I deal with the triggers to wanting to use? How do I deal with my environment? Um, the family component and working with my family and having open and honest conversations. So when I say holistic, we do mind, body, spirit. It's all encaptured when we're talking about the support for kids at ACT. And it's also pretty impressive how packed the days are too. So can you talk about what it looks like from the moment they wake up until they go to bed? Certainly. So we're huge on routine. We're huge on structure and supervision. So on a typical day, a youth wakes up around 630 in the morning to kind of get themselves moving around a little bit. We get them um, out in the day area for some breakfast. And then after breakfast, we have a morning community meeting, which is client driven. So it's really kind of taking a look at what my goals are for today, uh, what I'm working on. After that community meeting, we transition them up to school. And because we are in the Shawnee Mission School District, we have contracted with the Shawnee Mission Schools to provide academic instruction. So the kids go to school for three hours. After that um, academic block time, they go into a recovery counseling hour with one of my licensed staff members. And throughout all that time, they're also meeting with their clinician for individual and family therapy. And then they go into some lunch time and some free time. And then after that, we hit them up with some more recovery counseling and relapse prevention groups. And then after that, we have some physical activity time where kids are outside shooting hoops, playing badminton, playing some volleyball. Uh, we've partnered up with the Merriam Community Center that they can go out um, to the community center and um, work out, lift some weights, get on the elliptical machines, um, shoot some hoops. And then we come on back to the facility and we do, uh, whether we have a volunteer coming from the community, uh, we have presenters that come in that share their stories of recovery. 
And then we do um, some additional recovery hours during the evening. And then uh, we kind of start to wind down the night. Um, we don't do a lot of technology late at night because we really want their, their minds to kind of come at ease. We do kind of a rest and reflect kind of hour where there's some meditation music going on. They can do some yoga, they can do some journaling. Um, and then we kind of, we wind the night up, get them back in their rooms and we start all over again the next day. All right. And then can you talk a little bit about the food service they receive as well? Certainly. So we've partnered up with hy V. So hy V brings in our lunch and our dinner options for the kids. It comes fully heated, ready to be served. And that way, you know, we really try to emphasize the importance of um, good nutritional health as well. A lot of folks who are coming to us having been abusing drugs and alcohol, they haven't been um, taking very good care of their bodies. So a lot goes into the nutritional aspects of, um, of what we serve the kids. We also utilize positive behavioral supports where they're able to purchase additional snack items throughout the day and the evening. Um, you know, what we found is that if you have a healthier person, both um, from the calorie intake and also from the sleep, um, they're able to um, adjust much better to treatment. Um, they're awake throughout the day, they're well rested, they're energized, and, and they're able to um, kind of focus on their individual recovery throughout the time that they're here. There's probably some good advice for parents in general there about just <laughs> making sure the kids get get a, a good night's sleep and healthy food so that they're also more engaged maybe at school or more receptive to to parenting uh, rules and things like that as well, I'm sure. Certainly. And, you know, we emphasize, you know, kind of like the family eating style. So the kids are all eating together at the same time with the staff. And I think that, like you said, Teresa, even carrying that over to the home life, developing structure, but eating together as a family and having those conversations, because too often we get stuck with our face in our phone or we're bouncing around from activity to activity, really taking the time to sit with your family, have those family conversations, asking questions about what your day looked like, where'd you go, what'd you do for fun, who were you with? So just being an involved parent, asking questions and, and keeping in mind you are a parent, you're not a friend, and uh, really asking those important questions so that you can help raise your kids to be um, strong, productive members of society too. Great, great advice there for sure. So what is the average stay for, for those who are staying there? Sure. So a youth coming into ACT stays for about anywhere from three to four weeks on average. So it's about 24 days, but we are designed kind of from a curriculum standpoint to be four weeks. Um, when a youth first arrives in treatment, like kind of mentioned earlier, um, they may be withdrawing from their substances. So the first couple of days really are a foundational um, point of services, kind of getting them acclimated, but then also kind of teaching them some of those early recovery skills. And then as treatment kind of progresses on, we see their mind kind of return back to uh, a homeostasis kind of level, and they're able to kind of start thinking a little bit more rationally. Um, they're able to um, engage in conversation a little bit better with their clinician, start focusing more on what the relapse prevention is going to look like, and really start honing in on some of those skills to better assist them as when they return back to their home community. So by about that four-week um, stance, you know, what once looked like resistance to coming to treatment, because a lot of times the kids aren't asking to come to ACT, um, you see, kind of see their, their mind morph into this, oh my gosh, now I have to go home. Um, I have to go back to that environment. So they really kind of um, become a little bit more anxious about leaving. So it's really great to see them um, invest in their own time and their own energy when they get to ACT and really start making some identification of what they need to do differently with life. And are there supports available after they leave to make sure that they you know, don't relapse and, and don't need the center's help again? Certainly, because we do serve the entire state, we do a lot of coordination with different communities. But uh, for instance, with Johnson County specifically, uh, we do recommend a lower level of care once they complete treatment with us because we are the highest level of care. It's only um, appropriate that we send them back down to um, an outpatient level of care. So with Johnson County Mental Health, we have our AOAS program that I oversee. Um, so we'll make some recommendations that to the families and the kids that they continue with outpatient treatment. And my program specifically provides the individual, family, and group, along with case management services. And we also kind of partner up with, uh, with our providers in the mental health center to continue with medication management. So, uh, and we also partner up with the school districts. So when the kids are here, we're communicating with them so that when they do go back home, they know that they have an avenue to communicate with us as well. And the school districts have really been great about allowing my outpatient case managers to come into the school, provide some of those supports, or even pull them from the school hour and just kind of help them throughout the day. Because school is oftentimes a very stressful time uh, for a youth in recovery. 
That makes sense. Well, um, I know that, you know, not, not every person leaves there with amazing outcomes, but you've, you've been able to witness some pretty impressive um, um, outcomes. And so can you talk about some of the youth that you've, you've touched their lives and they've, they've actually expressed gratitude or appreciation for the work? Oh, certainly. Yeah. You know, going along with your theme of gratitude, we do have Thanksgiving coming up. Um, and I pointed out before, I could always say how grateful I am and appreciative I am to be working for the county and, and, and to have the job I have and, the, and working with the people I work with. But my favorite part of the gratitude piece is when, when we discharge a youth, they oftentimes leave a little bit of letters, uh, little letters for staff in their rooms. And some of these letters that uh, we get to read and, and share with each other, just talk about uh, the amount of care that they received and how grateful they are that they actually came to treatment. Uh, they talk oftentimes about the seeds that they that my staff have planted in them to to flourish and be successful in life and to to live a life of recovery. They talk about learning skills that they didn't think that they possessed, whether it was leadership or compassion or just um, caring about other people. Uh, we hear from the families about how we've ultimately kind of saved the lives of their children that um, they were so worried about their kids and their the spiral action that they were going through in their lives. So, but now they have an opportunity to, to get their kids back to to hug their children, to enjoy their time with them. So really, that's the gratitude that we appreciate is hearing from the kids that we've provided care to. That's awesome. And I am sure quite a morale booster for staff as well. Um, so just kind of finally, you know, as we're talking to a broader audience here through the podcast, um, you know, what should parents be looking for? You know, at what point should they be seeking services through you guys? Sure. You know, there's a lot of times that we say there's a lot of red flags that come up that are sometimes tough to see as a parent because when you're in the middle of it, but when you start to see um, your child kind of declining from what they're typical level of achievement look like if they're not doing well in school, if they're no longer playing sports, if their social circle of peers have come drastically changed, that you don't see the old friends anymore. Um, maybe the hygiene is starting to decline, that they're not um, dressing as nicely as they once were. Uh, they smell a little bit differently. Um, they leave the house wearing one outfit and coming back in a different outfit. Uh, so all these little things that you start to take a closer look at, um, but really those that school environment, the grades are getting fired from a job or um, those are all pretty um, strong signs that things aren't going well for them. They're more argumentative in the home. Maybe they're sleeping all day. I mean, yes, it's common for teenagers to wanna to take naps, but they're sleeping all day. They're up all night. They're sneaking out at night. All these little things that you're starting to be like, man, this, is, this isn't like what my son and daughter used to be like. So when you start to see those things, really reaching out for some supports, uh, obviously, um, the county has the mental health center that provides a lot of supports from a case management perspective, from a medication perspective. Uh, we have young adult programs, we have pediatric programs, we have the um, substance use program. So really reaching out to the mental health center and getting um, some support there. Um, people wanna know, do I need to start with outpatient? Do I need to start with residential? Um, when they call our facility, 913-715, uh, 7632. Um, that talks to one of my admin staff members, and they'll provide some recommendations for getting an assessment completed. And we do a full psychosocial assessment. It's about a six dimension assessment that will help you identify, do, does my child need to be in outpatient services or residential services? Uh, now, our current facility at ACT is a 10 bed facility. And folks want to know, is that enough to serve Johnson County? And is it enough to serve the state? And Unfortunately, right now, we are sitting out um, a wait list into March right now. So we know there are a lot of youth out there that are requiring services. So that's why we do sometimes make a recommendation that, yes, your child may need residential, but we're going to start them in outpatient ser services so we can provide, provide that care to them um, leading up to residential services. So once the assessment's completed, we make some recommendations. We kind of help um, the families uh, align with the services that the, the child will be needing and we'll help them out with um, kind of exploring the financial obligations versus um, insurance purposes and, and what we can do to best help them out. That's great. It certainly sounds like um, there's plenty of resources here in Johnson County and parents are not alone. It might be a very scary thing to encounter to consider that your child might be using substances and, and just knowing where to turn and where to, to, to go 
for those initial first steps, I think is, is a huge thing. So uh, we will, of course, have more information about how to access services in the show notes of this episode. And Kevin, I just want to thank you for being on here today and sharing information about the center. Happy to help out, Teresa. Thank you very much. And uh, if there's ever any questions that folks need, do not hesitate to reach out to us and we will do what we can to help. Sounds good. All right. And thank you for listening. You just heard Joko on the go. Join us next time for more Everything Johnson County. Have a topic you want to discuss? We want to hear from you. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter at JocoGov. For more on this podcast, visit jocogov.org forward slash podcast. Thanks for listening.